thank you all for joining us. We know it's really early in the reunion. There's so many exciting people to connect with. It's been really fun to be on campus already. Uh, I'm Jane Woodward, and, <laughs> and uh, thank you. Uh, a few months ago, I, someone reached out to me, someone really quite remarkable from another class who was organizing this panel and asked me if I would be on it. And then that person had to step out of organizing the panel and I found myself stepping into the role of bringing this marvelous group of people in front of you together. And part of the reason I jumped at the opportunity to fill the void that was created is that I have found as we explore the topic of climate risk and climate leadership that a very powerful thing for me has been the power of narrative, to hear people's stories. I personally believe everyone in this audience is thinking about climate risk and probably in one way, shape, or form, is a climate leader in their own way. And in many ways, I wish we could share all of our stories with each other. When I was asked to step in and host this panel, maybe some of you have noticed that I stacked the deck a little bit and that there's a bias for the class of, of 87. So there are many people from my class, but that doesn't mean... <laughs> That doesn't mean there are not all kinds of wonderful narratives from many classes besides, besides my own, besides our own. So let's, let's start with this program. So a, a fundamental premise is that climate risk is real, narrative is important, and that one of the things that has been occurring to me, if you asked my children, what did they learn in school about uh, the evolution of humankind and the economy, what was the greatest revolution in human history, what they still get taught in school is the greatest revolution was the Industrial Revolution. And I want to argue to you that the greatest revolution of our lifetimes is the climate risk revolution. And the understanding of that risk is causing innovation like I have never seen in my life before. And part of it is because we are decarbonizing everything everything, and we'll talk more about it as we go through, and you see the wonderful, Antonio's gonna talk about decarbonizing orange juice, okay? So that gives you a sense of everything, and you're gonna hear from a really broad range of panelists about the extent to which we are reinventing our whole economy and the great opportunities and challenges that faces for all of us. I'm going to click, there we go, you're already looking at me, so part of the reason I'm here is I have the privilege of living a block from Stanford, and my side, get, side gig for the last 32 years has been to teach at Stanford in the School of Earth and in the, in the, uh, what is now the Door School, which we'll talk about in a moment, and in the School of Engineering. And I've taught a class at Stanford called Understand Energy for 32 years, and I have the privilege of helping teach a class called Stanford Climate Ventures, which actually gives me enormous hope. Out of this class, 38 cl uh, companies have been launched out of the, over the last five years. We get MBAs and MSX students paired with PhDs and master's students largely from across the university launching decarbonizing companies. It's a very exciting opportunity to be part of. So why did we ask you to come here? Why did I get excited about this, this opportunity to present these remarkable people to you? Inspiration is the foremost word in my mind, and then context and thinking about, you're gonna hear from uh, Alexis and Peggy who come from senior executive roles in big public companies and their role in addressing climate risk. You're gonna hear from Debbie and Adam who lead very important NGOs and their role thinking about climate risk, which is very, very different from each other. I mean, this is a big revolution going across pretty much every space, right? And then you're gonna hear Linda talking about what it's like on two very different boards that she serves on, and she's been thinking about board leadership and thinking about climate risk. And then Antonio is in a role of being a very prominent CEO and a, and a European CEO who's looking at consumer products that are delivered around the world. And so those different perspectives was part of what I wanted to curate for our audience. Finally, when you leave today, uh, John Doerr's office was kind enough to agree to make possible our ability to distribute free copies of his book, Speed and Scale. And as you know, I think all of you know, John is the principal donor to the School of Sustainability at Stanford. He's chairman of Kleiner Perkins and just a huge leader in the space of decarbonization. 
And so I hope you'll enjoy the book. And uh, Peggy will talk a little bit about uh, the fact that LinkedIn is actually going to be making an interview with John possible for you to easily access as well. So just a moment about the new school, the, the sustainability school. And I think my colleague uh, Noah is going to address it a bit as well. I wanted you to know it's real. It's alive. It has a heartbeat, a vibrant one. There's been a series of opening events. There was a vibrant one last week that included student protests around fossil fuel investment in the new school from companies that may have fossil fuel roots but are really engaged in decarbonizing. And that student voice was held gracefully at the event. Uh, we have incredible leadership at the new school. The president of the university, all the deans of all the schools are supporting, including Dean Levin, who you'll hear from this afternoon, are all coordinating and collaborating with the New School of Sustainability. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, the birth of the new school has been a long process. The public has not necessarily heard about it, but Noah and I have been hearing about it for a long time. But the reason it had a long birthing process was to make sure it had the right birthing process. And it had the ownership and participation of students, of staff, and importantly, faculty across the entire university. So Arun Majumbar is the uh, inaugural dean. He is a phenomenal human being with great academic credentials, but has also been a huge public servant in our Department of Energy. And the words earth, climate, and society are core to what the new school is about. This is a complex diagram, but I want to share with you some ideas around it, which is there are four departments highlighted in the pillars shown in brown. And there are four institutes uh, that cross cut across those departments. And all of it cross cuts to all the other schools, as you see, and to external partners and the symbol of the earth all around the world. So there really is a global agenda for interaction of the new School of Sustainability at Stanford. And there's already been, for a, for a school that is just coming alive and, and is newly born, what's really important to understand is there are enormous assets that Stanford already had that are being folded into the new school. And so it is launching quite gracefully so far. And I encourage you, Noah and I are happy to answer questions later. And I encourage you to Google uh, Door School. There's a lot on the website, and there will be more. And because I'm an energy nerd, I had to stick this slide in to remind everybody that when you think of the fact we are decarbonizing everything, uh, everything, energy is not the full story. But many people don't realize that about 3 quarters of all our greenhouse gases are rooted in our energy system. And so this is just this is from a great resource called The Visual Capitalist to help you put that in context. Before I hand off to Noah, I'll just highlight, you know, I lead a, a very privileged life in terms of how I have been able to devote time and energy to climate risk, both in the classroom and in the investment world and a few other arenas. And this is just highlighting three areas that I'm very proud of and I love you to discover more about as time goes by. But I have helped build out a platform as more and more students at Stanford are interested in climate because of that three quarters rule of where the greenhouse gases come from, they're interested in energy. And we've really tried to build out essentially a concierge service to match students from all over the university with aspects of what's going on around energy and climate at Stanford through this Explore Energy program. The class I teach called Understand Energy, all of a sudden there's a huge appetite for literacy around the topic of energy because of people's interest in climate. And we are moving this class to basically a Khan Academy-like website where within the next few months, we'll launch it. We'll share it through the GSB with you. And you can help us make an even better and more useful portal for everyone to learn about energy and understand it. And I think one of the things I'm most proud of is when George Floyd impacted so, much, so many of us in so many ways, the students at Stanford really hollered for curriculum around energy equity and just transition activity. And I had the privilege of recruiting back one of my most remarkable students from over 20 years ago to lead a program in this area at Stanford and connect to many other faculty who have, a, have one oar in the water but wanted more of a, a, of a centerpiece of activity in this area. And so this area is really taking off. So just to give you a sense of little things going on. And now I'd like to pass to Noah. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Jane, and, and to the panel. And I really have, um, and first of all, I'll just echo what Jane said about the new school. So, um, 
Arun and I co-chaired the uh, committee that the president of the university um, assembled to uh, make recommendations about what Stanford could do. And our, our committee report uh, led to the decision about the school. So uh, Arun and I uh, got to know each other well. Um, just before COVID, uh, a report was due uh, March 20th, I think, something like that, 2020. So it has been a long process, but it's been, a, as Jane says, been a really um, invigorating process. And to see it open on September 1st has been, been really incredible. Um, so I really, uh, really just want to say three things that I hope you leave uh, here with in terms of the climate challenge. And it, um, so the same, the same three things I, I tell my class at the, in the beginning of every quarter. Um, you know, really, really the climate challenge is, is, is really uh, three interlocking grand challenges. We, we do not supply enough energy globally and uh, really, really not enough access, right? So first challenge is to um, at least double global energy supply and broaden access. And this double, th this double uh, you might get some debate on, um, on that, uh, the scale of the challenge. You know, if you, if you look at the, what the U.S. government says, uh, the, you know, the baseline projections are for a 50% increase in, in total global energy demand um, by the mid-century. But if you, you know, take a world of 10 billion people and take the most energy efficient countries in the OECD, that's more than double uh, our, our current total energy um, that we're supplying globally. And if you take a world of 10 billion all living like I do um, as an average American, then that's more than, a, a, than quadruple what we're supplying now globally. So the scale of the energy challenge is, is really, really big. And then uh, Jane mentioned uh, decarbonizing everything. So why are we, why are we decarbonizing everything? Uh, this is really just the, the fundamental physics of planet Earth. So the energy balance of, the, of, of planet Earth and Mars and Venus and all the other planets uh, is, is, uh, is pretty straightforward. In, you know, in, my, in my Frosch class, you know, we can derive it uh, in, in one class session and, and come back in the next session and, and, and uh, solve some, some actual uh, climate problems with it. It's that, it's that straightforward. It's been known for um, you know, more than 100 years uh, and, and is very consistent. So the fact is, is that as long as we're emitting greenhouse gases, we're going to keep getting more global warming. And so the fundamental physics of planet Earth are such that stabilizing the global temperature requires reaching net zero emissions. And that's why you see all of these uh, net zero goals. Um, you know, Stanford has uh, a, a goal of, of 2050 uh, to be in line with, with the Paris Agreement. So that's the announcement for the Board of Trustees a couple of years ago. California, we have um, even more ambitious goals. Biden administration has a net zero by 2050. China, uh, 2060. India, 2070. So that's where those net zero goals come from, is that just the reality that if we, if we want to stabilize the climate system, whether it's 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, 3 degrees, at any level, we're going to have to get to net zero emissions. Uh, the, the reality is, is that our energy system uh, right now is more than 80% fossil fuels. So think about doubling the scale of global energy supply, dramatically broadening access so that the you know, literally billions of people that don't have access to the benefits of modern energy resources, that they also have access, while simultaneously going from 80% you know, or more fossil fuel globally to net zero. And for stabilizing, you know, holding, holding global warming below two degrees C, you know, we have to do that uh, you know, in the mid-century time frame. So two grand challenges. I told you there's three. So the reality is we're already being impacted by global warming and climate change right now. And this is what a lot of my research is focused on. Um, you know, I think when I was in graduate school in the early 2000s, and even at the time of the Copenhagen Agreement, um, you know, in 2009, there was a sense that uh, two degrees of warming, uh, staying below two degrees would avoid dangerous uh, interference in the climate system to use the UN um, treaty language. The reality is we now know 
uh, that we're already being impacted by global warming right now. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's impacting people, it's impacting communities, it's impacting ecosystems, and uh, it's costing us. It's costing us quite a bit. So just a couple of examples from, from my own research. Uh, flood damages in the U.S., right? so the, the actual money that, that uh, flooding is costing in, us in the U.S., uh, our work suggests about a third of that over the last three decades has been contributed by changes in precipitation, and particularly intensifying extreme precipitation events. So this is billions of dollars a year that we're paying out. Uh, likewise, the U.S. crop insurance program, where we as, as taxpayers right, are supporting this crop insurance program, that's on the order of a billion dollars a year from global warming. Right? The, the, it's only about 20% of the total insured crop losses, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's again, bill, billion dollars a year. Uh, if we look globally at the impacts of long-term warming on uh, the economic growth, the just aggregate economic growth at the country level, country level GDP, we find that uh, there's a whole lot of people living in, in uh, countries that are already very warm that have had their economic growth dragged down by long-term warming. So, for example, India, our calculation central estimate on the order 30% uh, lower per capita GDP today than if global warming hadn't happened. Brazil, about 25% lower per capita GDP today than, than if global warming hadn't happened. Nigeria, about 30% lower. And what that means is that in aggregate, economic inequality is substantially larger today than if global warming hadn't happened. About, uh, depending on your metric, 25 to 40% greater economic inequality uh, at the country level today than without global warming. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not saying global warming caused economic inequality, but it has, it has clearly exacerbated economic inequality by dragging down uh, growth in countries that are already warm, already poor, have large populations. So uh, this is not about uh, how do we prepare for 2100. This is about how do we uh, build resilience to the climate change that not only has already happened, is already impacting us, but is guaranteed to happen even if we uh, solve these other two challenges. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Noah. And Peggy. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to invite each of you to pretend that you are me, Director of Global Environmental Sustainability at LinkedIn. And what you would do, uh, you know, we know that in the past, businesses were viewed as the villains and they were the producers of all of the problematic emissions and pollutions, but now increasingly are stepping into a role to be really important parts of the solution. So how does someone in my role approach that? And these are three areas that I wanted to highlight for you because I think they really illustrate how my daily routine has changed in the last decade, and it's really reflective of how the whole field of sustainability has changed, really expanding the scope and the ambition of what people in a corporate sustainability role can do. So the first thing that every company has to do if they say they're really committed to environmental sustainability is have a strategy and take some commitments, take some pledges. And I'm going to tell you in a moment a little bit more about ours. The second thing really is to look at your company. What are the particular assets that your company has that no other company has? And therefore, what's the unique contribution that you can make that nobody else can? And I'll take you through how I thought about that and how I'm working across our product and engineering team. And then finally, if you think of the classic definition of sustainability, it's got three pillars, right? ESG, environmental, societal, and governance. And traditionally, we've all kind of operated in those silos. But increasingly, we're realizing that that's not appropriate, it's not fair, and it's not as effective as if we really integrated all of those factors together. So when I approach initiatives or programs or investments, I'm always looking at not just what are the environmental impacts, but what are the societal impacts? What are the diversity, equity, inclusion impacts? How are we reaching out to marginalized communities? How are we addressing environmental justice and environmental equity? And so how, what kinds of partnerships are we forming to, you know, beyond our own four walls, uh, impact the broader community? 
Um, so I'm going to, you know, just spend another second on that, that middle pillar. Um, you know, how many of you have a profile on LinkedIn? Yeah. So we have 850 million people with profiles. Um, we have, you know, tens of millions of jobs posted every day on LinkedIn. We have lots of conversation happening and connectivity. So that's what I think about when I say what are LinkedIn superpowers. So I'm going to show you some examples of how in our three marketplaces, we're trying to connect employers and job seekers so they can do green work. We're using all of that mega data that's anonymized about all of us to really provide insights to governments and business leaders and all of us about where's the green economic opportunity, where are the gaps that need to be addressed. And then our North Star is in our uh, more nascent products and services marketplace, but how can we connect buyers and investors with green choices, suppliers? So let's... Um, Let's dig a little more deeply into our commitments, and, and I'll just get a little more personal now. Um, I joined LinkedIn in uh, September of 2016, and in December, Microsoft purchased us. So my friend said, well, you probably have about a year, and then they'll decide that the whole thing is redundant because they have a team of 100 at Microsoft working on, including Bill out there in the audience. But happily, the exact opposite happened, and, and actually Bill and I did work quite a bit on some water stuff together. I think it's been the greatest thing for LinkedIn to become part of Microsoft because Microsoft really was ready from the CFO to the CEO to the chief legal officer to st step up in 2020 with some really ambitious goals. We want to be carbon negative, water positive, and zero waste by 2030. Not by 2040, not by 2050. And that's important because this is the decisive decade. So stepped out on the stage and made those commitments, but not really knowing exactly how we were going to do it, just knowing that that's what had to happen. So we were going to do our damn best to, to make it happen. Why do we say carbon negative instead of carbon neutral? It's because we want to go beyond just, you know, minimizing our carbon emissions and offsetting. We want to go reduce, you know, by 50% our scope three emissions in the next decade, which is, you know, it's very inclusive of every activity in the company. But also, we want to offset our historic carbon. So we're going to invest in now, for LinkedIn, it's relatively easier, you know, because we were founded in 2003. For, for Microsoft, that's 50 years of carbon, so um, interesting. And the reason why do that is because we're in a position that some other companies aren't, so we should do more. Uh, zero waste is probably obvious um, and how important that is to move to circularity. And then in terms of water positive, the same thought, replenish more than we withdraw. Now, Jade made a point earlier that I want to echo. Uh, we can't do that without engaged employees in our company, and I'm wanting to keep a small a central team and make sure that we have embedded sustainability functionality and responsibility across all of our, our business. And then the second strategy pillar really is looking beyond our own four walls, what I mentioned before. How can we leverage everything about our platform to drive the you know, growth of green companies, green jobs, green insights, environmental justice? So what we've been doing is really trying to get smart about what do companies have to do in order to take a climate action journey. They have to be able to measure their impacts, report them. They've got to transform their business if we're going to achieve what Noah was talking about. Redesign how they manufacture, how they design products, distribute them. They have to hire and train people with particular green skills. They have to green their supply chain. They have to be able to communicate and advocate to the world. And then individuals, in order to remain marketable, right, are going to increasingly need to have green skills. So we're thinking about all that. And here's how I'm trying to operationalize it, working very closely with a lot of people across our company. And these are just a few things. But maybe you saw on our platform last, uh, well, April, for Earth Month, we um, created a green jobs collection. So if you're interested in doing green work, it's not just for people with titles like mine. What we did is we said, of all the job postings on our, um, you know, on our site at any given time, which ones are calling for a, you know, a set amount of green skills? We're going to call that green work. Because if you're in sales, but the job posting says you've got to do that in a green way, that's green work. And I'd love to have all of you think about that in terms of your function. It's green if you take the actions and make the decisions in that way. So that, that's still there, the green jobs collection. 
And then we have top voices. There's amazing people around the world that are thought leaders. We want to elevate them. We're a social media platform. We can do that. We can get you know, better visibility for them. And you can you know, look up top green voices on LinkedIn and follow them. Uh, we produced a global green skills report recently basically because we have more data than anybody in the world about the global marketplace and, and workforce and where are the green jobs emerging, what skills are they requiring, in what geographies do they have a gap. They, they have the job postings but not the, the workers, so how do we need to reskill people? And then finally, as, as Jane mentioned, we have LinkedIn Learning and, and maybe some of you have taken courses, but I want to build out a really robust catalog of green skills, greenhouse gas accounting, greening your supply chain, environmental justice, you know, the whole range. And so it's early days, but you can check those out. And John Doerr's course will be launching soon. Thank you, Peggy. So there you go. Thanks, Peggy. Clearly, I need to get a LinkedIn account. I think I'm probably the only person <laughs> oh, in this room. I can help you with oh, that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Alexis Limbarakis. And um, I'm really happy to be back on campus and hear about this new sustainability school. Um, sustainability wasn't even a, a term we talked about back in the day in 92. It's, it's crazy how times have changed so much. Um, and share a little bit about the work I've been doing related to climate um, at Clorox. So a little bit about me. I've been at Clorox for um, my whole career since the GSB, so 30 years this, this September. And I started in marketing roles, so a variety of marketing roles. And then I got the temporary tap, do you want to do a rotation into our newly formed sustainability team? I'm like, sure, they, sure, why not? I don't know what it means exactly, but sure. Um, and uh, short, long story short, I never looked back. I, I was like, I'm not going back to marketing. I can have a much greater societal impact, which is my personal MO, if I stay in this role and lead the charge in, in driving sustainability into our business. So it's uh, been quite a journey. Um, so today, I want to cover kind of three examples of the, the kind of more recent work we've been doing to reduce our own emissions from a kind of a manufacturing uh, CPG company. So you get a feel for the kind of work and the challenge that we're facing. Um, and before I get into these three different areas, I wanted to first give you a little bit of a backdrop, a little context for our climate journey, and this is rather an eye chart, it's more, meant more for studying, but it really maps our uh, climate journey, past, present, and future. Um, we've been at this since 2008, when we set our first sustainability strategy, and I'm pleased to say that we've exceeded all of our greenhouse gas reduction goals through our past decade and two consecutive uh, uh, goal periods. Um, but we met those primarily through efficiency measures. So things like changing out equipment to more energy efficient equipment, um, changing processes, uh, optimizing our distribution um, and logistics networks, um, reducing the amount of materials in our products and packaging, you know, kind of the block and tackle kinds of things you'd expect from a company like Clorox who's very focused on cost reduction. Cost reduction equals greener, right? So it was pretty easy and natural for us. But dial forward, the climate crisis is accelerating. <laughs> And so, too, we realize we have to have much deeper goals, much more challenging goals that are really going to require transformation of our entire value chain, much of which we don't have direct control over. So we, too, have set you know, net zero by 2050 um, targets as well as you know, aggressive reduction targets in line with client science for 2030 and are you know, on the way for much more greater degree of change. So three of these areas I'll talk about. Um, let's start with renewable electricity. Okay, so Noah said, it's a, and, and, and both, uh, both of you guys said, it's an energy problem. So when it comes to renewable, elect, well, when it comes to energy at a company like us, who primarily uses electricity to power our, our operations, you really have two choices for reducing your emissions. You can either use less of it, or you can get renewables, cleaner energy sources. So I told you we've been focused on efficiency measures for over a decade, and there's not lot, a lot left there to make meaningful gains in efficiency. So we've now switched our focus to renewables and sourcing renewables, which sounds kind of easy, right? But not if you live in the United States of America where the grid is not green, or much of the globe where it's not green. I can't call the utility provider in our location and say, I want renewables. Most of the, uh, the, uh, the regions in which we operate are regulated, and this, there are not options for you. And we have small facilities. We're not huge, actually. So we can't put 
big enough solar panels on site to, to, you know, to power our energy. So we're forced to get into very complex financial instruments called virtual power purchase agreements. So we're not an energy expert, but we had to get really smart about how are we gonna procure this through these things that essentially Clorox guarantees a developer a fixed price for the energy coming off of newly built um, facilities over a 12 year horizon, wind, solar, and in return, we get to keep the renewable energy attributes of that energy as it's produced. So it's a very complex financial instrument, uh, exposes the company to all kinds of market volatility and energy markets, again, not our expertise. And when we went to our former CEO of several years back, you know, the eyes rolled back in the head and it was like, what? No. Um, dial forward though, investors are pushing. They started to recognize the only way we could get renewable energy at scale was to do this kind of thing. And our new CFO is really, really supportive. And I'm pleased to say we now have two VPPAs executed that are covering 100% of our North American energy, which wow. is the vast majority wow. of our emissions. So huge, huge win for us. The next area is plastics and circularity. So I'm sure you've all heard about the plastics crisis, but I'm sure You've heard it in terms of plastics pollution, right? The plastics getting to the oceans, the microplastics in the air and in our soils, um, and the pollution aspect and the waste aspect of plastics is really significant. But you, what you don't hear as much is the carbon footprint of plastics, right? Carbon is, a, I mean, plastics are a pretty carbon intensive material, it's particularly virgin plastics coming from petroleum feedstocks. Now, sometimes plastics can actually have a lower end-to-end -end carbon footprint than some alternative materials because they can be pretty lightweight, but yet and still, we have a lot of plastics in our packaging. So for Clorox to get to net zero or reach our goals, we've got to re reduce the uh, emissions associated with our plastic packaging. So we're doing some kind of closer in things with recyclability and recycled content, which is a little bit better, but really the trans more transformational work we're doing is trying to change consumption models, um, the way consumers consume and use our packaging. So closer in, we're doing things like concentrated refills, um, where a consumer will buy a starter kit with a trigger sprayer and a little cap with concentrated uh, chemicals, you know, screw it on and then add water and you've, you know, you've got your solution, and then over the life of that trigger, you save 80% of the plastics that you had before. So you can get a big cut if, if this takes off. Consumer behavior change is not easy, though. They want more value from this, right? So this one is a big challenge from a consumer standpoint, but logistically, it's pretty straightforward. More transformative, though, are refill models um, that are requiring that, re that package to be used completely over and over again. And we're participating in TerraCycle Loops program, both e-commerce and brick and mortar versions of this, where, for example, our wipes container, stainless steel container, um, consumer puts a deposit on it. So they're sort of renting it in a way. They put a deposit on it, um, it comes with its wipes, they return it either to the brick and mortar store or it gets picked up in the e-commerce model. TerraCycle washes them and ships them back to us to refill them and get them back out. So you can imagine the reverse logistics and the uh, economics and the environmental footprint of that, uh, that reverse logistics. Like you need scale and massive infrastructure changes to make this happen. Mm -hmm. But we're participating with a number of other peer companies to try to learn our way into how we can make this um, functional and ultimately net zero at the end of the day. The third model is refill stations. So rather than having all this reverse logistics, consumer goes to a refill station, purchases the very first unit package, fills it up, takes it home, and every time they want new product, they bring their own package, which they know they've controlled it for cleanliness, et cetera, so there's no risk of having to wash it and use all the energy to wash it. Bring it back, refill it. Huge behavior change there, and huge infrastructure. Imagine retail environments with all that capital installed. So these are not easy to solve for, but we are trying to work on how we're gonna transform consumption in, uh, in, the, in the globe. Last but not least, and I've hit my limit here, I'm gonna touch on this really quickly, but supplier engagement. It doesn't sound sexy, but it's really critical to us achieving our, our goals because more than 90% of our emissions, more than 90% sit outside the four walls of Clorox mostly upstream in the raw material supply chains we use for our products and our packaging. A lot downstream too with our distribution networks. 
So for us to achieve our goals, our suppliers have to change. We can certainly change materials, we can change suppliers if they're not playing ball, but they also have to come on this journey. And we as a CPG company get a lot of the pressure, right, because campaigns go after brands. Um, but the reality is way upstream in these supply chains is where a lot of these emissions go. So we're trying to put our, you know, our voice, but we're only a $7 billion company. We, so this is related to my final call to action to you guys is if you have influence on a board, if you have influence on a trade group, if you are still working in a company, if you uh, can call policymakers, we all have to be pressuring the system because we're never going to get to where we need to go and solve this ex existential crisis without all of our action. So thanks. That's a great message, Alexis. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to pivot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I want to say at one point we're only seven billion dollars. I appreciate that, Alexis. <laughs> um, Jenny Gorman, um, I'm the president and CEO of the Green Lining Institute, and thank you, Jane, and everybody for inviting me uh, to share a unique perspective. Um, my growth as a woman of color doing climate and economic equity um, has been layered and quite complex. Oddly enough, uh, I was the only black woman in the class, uh, the GSB class of 1987. So I hope to sprinkle in bits of my personal and professional life that informs uh, my leadership in addressing uh, climate risk and economic prosperity. I hope you might see some grit and grace and gratitude in my talk. So let me start with the practice of equity. And I appreciate that y'all have already mentioned equity. Uh, equity ensures um, that wherever you participate from, that you be allowed to prosper and each reach your full potential, recognizing that the path for different people start at different points. Um, at my work at Greenlining Institute, uh, we have five core equity strategies. First, a just and healthy economy. This perspective comes from my early career. I worked on Wall Street for an investment bank on the fixed income capital markets trading desk. It's a lot of debt being moved around the globe. I then went from Wall Street to working at the largest construction company in the US, you can probably figure that out, where I got a passport and combined my undergrad engineering degree with my MBA and worked on big international infrastructure projects from an in-house boutique um, financing equity division. Uh, I felt I got a front row seat, deep, uh, deeply immersed experience in global, how global and US capital markets work. Second, we focus on economic equity. Here we look uh, to build household wealth, family by family. We work to close the wealth gap that too many Americans experience. This is where my years of nonprofit work come in. Uh, working with workforce and community de development. Here is where I've learned the disparities between communities was dark and stark and devastating. So third, you see there, our commitment to climate equity comes directly from evaluating the economy and the pursuit of building intergenerational wealth. Quite frankly, climate change is a threat multiplier. All inequities that communities are facing, whether economic, social, or health, Climate change significantly compounds each of them, separately and together. Four, intersectional leadership. This is where lots of policy and legislative work comes in, and Adam's gonna talk about um, AB 525, which we also helped um, pass, um, so amen, brother. Uh, there are too many community voices that were silenced for decades, so we're able to see both sides, the, uh, the private sector and the public sector, to build the power across these issues. As the, the quote goes, there is no such thing as single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives. So we create intersectionality. Plus, I, I'm a Title IX baby. I played D1 basketball and I was that first generation to get a full ride scholarship, all due to policy of gender inequality in education and ultimately in sports. Besides, having played ball uh, for so many years allowed me to bond with some of my male classmates who welcomed me to play in the regular pickup game. And lastly, five, we are expanding and building new leaders. I've made a lifetime commitment of working with young people to pour into them confidence and self-assurance and let them know on some days their shoulders would be burdened 
with service. But nonetheless, they will lead. And it was young people who had clarity on better ways of doing things and unapologetically kept me honest. And inevitably, when I was in a season where my valleys seemed much more frequent than my peaks, it was always a youthful voice that gave me courage to accept the humanity of others and the humility to understand that we are not immune to pain. Let me define climate equity for you now. Uh, just really quickly, uh, everything converges to climate equity for us. And as it, it really is repeating everything you heard. So that as an NGO, we're like right on, we were on the same path. Um, in working with the climate risk, the determinants though, the determinants present themselves clearly and loudly as redlining. So what you're looking at here is uh, redlining, which was coined from how the federal government the federal government and bank lenders would draw red lines on maps and exclude people from owning homes um, based on race. So we could have a whole nother talk about redlining and how it works in our society. But redlining was a banking and real estate strategy. So let me go over this, these maps really quickly, but they tell you one thing. The map in the center is the 1937 red line map of my hometown, Oakland, California. All the other maps are indicators. So to, to my right, your left, the health indicators align with COVID is the same redlining map. If you look at um, digital divide, where does broadband get to? Where does the technology go to? Same uh, redline map. If you look at the carbon footprint, if you look at uh, traffic and air pollution, and the the one near the bottom, the Cal Enviro screen, is a tool that the uh, the NGOs working with the elected uh, agencies take 21 indicators and put a footprint onto the impact, same red line map. Mm -hmm. So it becomes um, evident that the climate um, risk um, continue to uh, follow these red line maps. But redlining was banned in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act. So why is it that these maps are so closely still aligned? That's because the policies, the markets, and the behaviors reflect inequitable access to resources investment. Here is where you have to ask the question of the integrity of the markets. The markets need to evolve now. We also have so much access to data, and that's mentioned here by everybody. We have data science, we have predictive analytics, we have twinning, we have smart data, and we have GIS that allows us to organize, visualize, and analyze different layers of data from different paths, equity. My three key leadership, uh, and I'm almost out of time here, my three key leadership, uh, climate leadership, equity is not ESG. Equity is not DEI. Equity is the practice, is a practice, is multifaceted, stretches across policy, movements, industry, capital markets, community development. It may be the most effective tool we have to address climate risk with an all-encompassing, long-lasting outcome. I wish I could have been trained on how to understand and use equity in my career. But as we built out climate equity, we identified the same solutions and the, that the others have identified, which is deep decarbonization. At Greenlining, we are leading by acknowledging this profound moment of transportation. We are driving policies and laws. We are establishing standards. Uh, all the stuff that you see with the, in, the uh, IRA, the chips and science, um, the Justice 40, all of that is policy that is grounded in equity. And we are strongly so in solidarity with movements. And one of the key movements is electric vehicles. There's a tipping point and there's no going back on EVs. Uh, lastly, uh, we will not create the new frontiers of redlining. Instead, we seek economic so solidarity together with innovative perspectives coming from all corners of our community, regardless of status. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you. Debbie, it's a, it's a privilege to be sitting next to you and all my friends from environmental work across the decades. Uh, I want to start with a question for the audience. How many of you were here in California on September 6th? Do you remember what happened? Did you get a flex alert in your phone? 
And did you respond to and turn down your appliances? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so how, how, how many times would you be willing to do that over the next few summers, do you think? Well, I'm here to make the case for one new clean energy resource that I think would help balance out the grid, uh, develop the increase in our clean energy supply that Noah described before, and also provide a greater level of environmental justice. And that new resource is offshore wind. A uh, little over three years ago, I was approached by some developers who were starting a new trade group called Offshore Wind California uh, to bring a remarkable new technology that is enabling the winds from the sea to become part of the power for our uh, daily needs, our industry, our home life, all the things that we use electricity for. And starting with an initial group of six companies, we've now over the last three years uh, expanded this to 47 companies in the entire ecosystem of offshore wind, including some oil majors, uh, wind blade manufacturers, technology firms, and others. Uh, we have become an important voice for advancing offshore wind as uh, a new resource for the state, and I would submit to you for the world because the opportunity for offshore wind is not just here in California, but it's pretty much across the globe where there are strong winds that among the most appealing aspects of this is that just at the time uh, when you were getting that flex alert here in California is the time when the winds are the strongest and complement uh, the, uh, the other resources that we have, solar, onshore, wind, hydro, and other renewables. We need a complementary resource like offshore wind to balance out our requirements. And offshore wind has been shown in Europe and in starting very soon on the East Coast and hopefully not too long from now here in California will be one of the key pieces of the puzzle to help expand the use of renewable energy across the globe. Uh, as Debbie uh, mentioned, one of the early things our trade group was able to do working in coalition with environmental justice organizations, labor unions, environmental groups, was to advance a bill in California called AB 525. Um, it sets out uh, requirements for the state agencies to develop a strategic plan for offshore wind and to set uh, goals over two key uh, uh, milestones, 2030 and 2045. And just uh, two months ago, the state of California approved the first of these goals, setting a, a target by 2030 of five gigawatts of offshore wind. A gigawatt is enough power to support, depending on where you live in California, between half a million and a million homes. Um, so five gigawatts by 2030 and 25 gigawatts, which is nation leading goal uh, by 2045. And this ties in with the state's uh, objective of becoming carbon neutral by 2045 and having all of its energy supplied by renewable or zero carbon sources. Um, so that was a big victory for all of us and thanks to Debbie and her allies who helped on the campaign. And then just um, a couple of weeks ago the Biden administration announced a very important floating offshore wind initiative uh, to help bring down the cost of floating offshore wind. This is the technology that will be used here in California because our waters are so deep that you can't actually have fixed foundations. You have to have floating platforms, which is uh, technology that was perfected in the oil and gas industry 20 years ago. And the big milestone that we're all looking forward to in our world uh, of offshore wind is this December when the federal government will auction off the first set of lease areas off California. And I have a map here showing the two locations that are the focus of the lease, one in the far north in Humboldt, and then a second one in the central coast of Morro Bay. Now, if you were following this uh, back in February, there was a similar lease auction for six sites off New York and New Jersey. And the combined 
uh, bids that were eventually accepted and approved by the federal government totaled $4 billion. So there's a lot of money at stake and capital that's being invested in this new uh, approach to generating renewable energy. We're hopeful that these auctions will go successfully. Some of our member companies will be among the bidders in the auction, which will happen live online probably in the first two weeks of December. Um, our organization has been trying over these last three years to educate the public about the value of offshore wind, to engage with stakeholders across a wide spectrum, um, to also uh, be the hub for information through conferences, through our website, uh, through testimony to a variety of public settings. And um, I'd say another dimension to this that I have found particularly exciting is the passion that people feel who work in this industry of being part of something that is one uh, solution to climate change. Uh, there are dozens of companies that are hiring people, engineers, uh, environmental technicians, uh, capital market experts, uh, a whole range of job functions that are needed to make offshore wind succeed. Um, and here's an image actually from Denmark of what these marvelous machines look like. One of the great advantages of them is that they can be so located 15 to 20 miles offshore, so basically outside of the view shed and uh, through a system of cables and transmission lines bring the power of the winds offshore to the grid. This is what we hope to see here in California in eight to 10 years. Um, I wanna just leave you with, with one thought, which is that um, all my professional life, I've been working on climate change and I've never had a opportunity where I felt like I could use the skills I learned here at the GSB to build an organization, to rally a coalition of supporters, to set in motion the policy framework for a state as influential as California. And with the support of our businesses, with the support of an administration that is very jazzed about this and is doing all the right things, both at the federal and the state level to enable this uh, to advance, uh, we're making remarkable progress, and I encourage all of you, uh, at whatever stage you are in your career or to young people that you may be advising, if you're looking for something that's the next big thing in renewable energy, offshore wind is one of them. So thank you very much. There we go. I, I didn't realize you were the only black woman in our class, so um, what an amazing leader you are, and um, I didn't know that now. <laughs> <laughs> you won uh, Phil Huck in the Cross player. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. Breaking barriers, so, um, appreciate it. Uh, Jane wants us to tell stories, so um, I think... Uh, I, I, I served on the board of Morgan Stanley for 25 years, was really a, um, a specialist in um, markets, ran global research, equity, and fixed income. I was also the chief talent officer, taught a lot about leadership. And my journey through there and since then has been about markets, transformation, and leadership. And I, I'm like Adam, my whole career is not going to climate. I find myself immersed in climate these days. Um, being in, in boardrooms, so I want to talk about the stories of, of how that happened to kind of share a little bit, you know, what I'm seeing. Um, and I'll start with MSCI as a business. So what has transformed the board leaders as well as our CEO is both top-down things that are happening as well as bottom-up energy, not only from our kids, but from our employees. Um, you know, the... the uh, uh, businesses at MSCI. Do people know what MSCI is? Is that familiar to people? Uh, okay, so MSCI is the S&P of the globe. So people are familiar with the S&P 500. So if you talk to any investor, either an asset owner or a hedge fund or a money manager, and you ask them what, how they measure their returns on their investments and their risk, 
They use MSCI indices and MSCI tools in the global environment. And, um, you know, the MSCI ACQUI index covers over 10,000 companies globally, representing most of the investable capital on the equity side. Um, and we've been building data sets and tools to help investors understand risk and return for forever. And as we have grown as a business, um, we continue to bring investors into our boardroom and say, you know, what's on your mind? How are we doing? And I would say only five years ago, most of those investors were not interested in climate. Uh, they thought it was um, impact investing, lower returns in traditional investments, their fiduciary responsibility. You know, somebody investing teachers' pension funds, they have to make sure they earn the highest return for teachers. It wasn't out of being ugly or bad, it was they had to earn the best returns. And I remember um, Fidelity came in, their two top funds, uh, five years ago, and all of a sudden we asked that question and they said um, that they were really morally feeling uncomfortable because of their kids. That something was changing, something was amiss. This, this, the capitalism, the way we thought about it, was not really creating a better earth and better world. But it was just cracking the window open. They didn't know how to you know, manage that. Well, roll forward. We had a lot of people building lots of businesses at MSCI. We gave them agency to do that. One of the businesses that took off was ESG, which is not one thing. <laughs> um, but research around these areas, and the one that just blew the doors off all the others is, is climate. And we started making a lot of money and all of a sudden, the people in our um, climate areas, the, the, uh, the uh, research people, were at Davos and every place else. And their voices, which they've had for a long time, probably as long as Adam has, became mainstream, right? They went from uh, being you know, maybe more liberal and not core to markets to becoming mainstream. So we work with, um, you know, any investor around the globe, the top thinkers, uh, Mark Carney, Paris Climate, you know, we are hand in hand. Uh, you probably know BlackRock, Larry Fink, has been very vocal since 2012 in letters he writes to people about stewardship and what that looks like and where climate and um, DEI, equity, social justice, you know, rank. But the, the transformation, this is the largest, as Jane said, change in the economic infrastructure of the world and businesses have been one of the best at solving for efficient you know outcomes of um, uh, um, of transformations right we need government's help we need certain things you know uh, regulated and policies put in place but businesses must be at the table driving these changes so MSCI has um, uh, in this period of time, over five years, our business has grown dramatically. We're talking to investors all the time. They are buying all the data they can around risk related to climate, um, as well as diversity, you know, equity inclusion data. Um, we, we promoted a, 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 our, our Peggy and Alexis equivalent. We decided we needed one of our top C-suite people. We took the president of the biggest business we have, and we put her into that role. That shows you know, how complicated it is to figure out your own footprint. Mm -hmm. And you're not only working with your internal constituents, your employees, your, you know, your costs, you're working with your supply chain, as has mm -hmm. been referenced. And you have to go out and influence them and basically encourage them to change so you can get green together and let them know that they're not going to be part of your ecosystem if they don't change. right? So it's, it takes huge diplomacy and uh, you know, force of will. We've, we, we acquired the board supported the acquisition of something called Carbon Delta, which are climate scientists. Now, I am not a climate scientist. I do have to oversee and you know, support the allocation of capital and make sure I'm asking very astute questions. These guys built, it, it, this is a very hard problem if you don't know, know how you can have impact, right? So even if businesses have to make the change, how and where do you work? Well, right now we have a suite of tools that it enables any investor to look at any company, any portfolio globally, and based on both information the, public, the company releases, which hopefully is as much as scope one, scope two, and scope three, but it isn't always complete, and uses AI and other data scraping sources to understand it. And we create products that you could look at and you could understand what your portfolio looks like or what your stock looks like in terms of risk. 
um, what the green opportunities are in your companies, what the transition strategies need to be, what the physical risk of every plant in every company's portfolio is. It's a heat map that shows in India or in Florida or in you know, Germany where your plants are and which ones, what they look like in terms of risk right now to climate change and what they look like in 2050 so you can plan. And then, importantly, we have a tool um, which is trying to help companies align with net zero that's simple. It basically looks at the budget the world has, how much more we can pollute uh, to not go above 1.5 degrees Celsius, and then it budgets who, what sectors get a certain amount and what you as a company get. And then we do the analytics to say, based on what you've reported in terms of scope one, scope two, and scope three, and what you're intending to do, and then what we know from other scrape data, where we think you are in a temperature range. So MSCI just got uh, science-based um, target approval that we, we are at 1.3 um, by 2050. Um, but you will see you know, energy companies at six degrees, right? So it's a simple idea. Are you contributing your fair share or not? And that helps the investment industry figure out you know, how and where to invest. Um, so, you know, we become better at being governors of this and at promoting it, again, through top down and bottoms up. At CSX, this is, you know, the railroads are three times as efficient in green as our trains. And railroads, because they've been in the business of understanding stakeholders for a long period of time, have been doing materiality analysis, which only companies are beginning to think about. What do all your stakeholders think? Where, where do they want you to move? Where are the risks emerging? We've been doing it. I don't know, since 2005. So I walk into the CSX boardroom and the teams have created you know, a, a carbon strategy that is aligned with science-based targets. We're the first in the industry um, because it's been bottoms up driven fundamentally based on the nature of our business for a long time. But it wasn't top down driven. And really the work of the board, I chair the governance and now called governance and sustainability committee is to say, okay, how does this relate to our overall strategy? Are we funding it properly? Are we marketing it properly? And as we start to walk into this, we find that our supply chain wants to do business with us because we're green. So Amazon wants to do business with us. They do a ton of business with trucks. So we have to be efficient enough to deliver to their needs so that they can choose us. So, so the ecosystem is in the middle of helping each other you know, transform. Um, so CSX has won a ton of awards, but most importantly will be our role going forward. Can we convert a lot of transportation business that's currently on trucks and on roads from dirtier to cleaner ways of doing it while being extremely efficient with our customers? And my last area of work has been with Stanford Women on Boards. Does anybody know what Stanford Women on Boards is? Ooh. A few members in the audience. Okay, so I got asked a couple years ago to join the team to really think about how do we get and elevate women into the boardroom. And by the way, we want men too. <laughs> and we want any minority. But we, but we have so many grads across the whole Stanford campus of women that are amazingly qualified, but they're just not in the networks to get into the boardroom. So our job is to cultivate the next generation. And so I've recently co-authored a piece with another woman on Stanford Women on Boards, Mary Clark. It's called Leading Edge Stewardship, and it defines what leading edge stewards do in boardrooms so that they can create long-term sustainable value. And climate is a huge input into that. It has changed the amount of uncertainty that boards are dealing with, requires boards to be an asset to their management teams, have skills that augment the management team's skills. They don't do the business, but they are able to see around corners and help manage risk. And the leading edge stewardship talks about the ethos, which is a Stanford ethos. <laughs> it starts with you have to be a high-performing team not you just walk in as an individual in the boardroom and meet once every four years. The second is a growth mindset that you're learning constantly all the time around what matters most. The third is you build trust with your colleagues and with the management team so you can talk about, as Jim Collins would say, the brutal facts, the good, bad, and the ugly, so you can learn to lead forward differently and transform outcomes. And then, the, the, and then the, um, we create a rubric that goes through 14 areas of responsibility. Where do you really need to work? And on strategy, well, on purpose is the first one. All of my boards have started to redefine purpose. They recognize that purpose isn't making money as it was 15 years ago. Purpose is really about aligning your behavior, your values, with what's going to attract and um, build sustainable value, both shareholders and stakeholders. And that means everything you do, how you talk, how you walk, what your CEO does, how you transact, has to be green, right? Has to be 
moving in the direction of transition and carbon right now. And um, uh, so there will be a lot more you know, to show on that. We're doing a lot of training on that. We have coming in on, January, on November 28th an interview with Jim Schnabu, but we'll continue to try to work with our men colleagues in boardrooms and our women colleagues in boardrooms to cultivate our youngest you know, people at Stanford. We have 1,500 members and, and get leading edge stewardship ideas into the boardroom, including how do you manage strategic uh, planning sessions that are no longer one or five years, but are 30 years now with these transition issues. So thank you. Woo. Well, hello, and pleasure being here indeed. <coughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor. Um, I've um, listened very admiringly to everything, uh, all the great ideas. Um, I'll be a little bit, bit more down to earth, because uh, down to earth, which, what we're doing is every, every day um, in, involved in, in the um, um, matter. So let me see. Um, I was asked to talk about three ideas, three interesting ideas, which is not so easy. So um, I thought actually we're here pre prepared um, talking about some products which are sustainable, which uh, we're doing in, in our company, some packaging which is sustainable, and then some production units which is sustainable. Now, um, uh, let me see. Uh, okay, here we are. I'll give you a two-minute background, background of the company, otherwise it will, nothing, nothing will be understood, I believe. But quite simple, that's what we do. We have, we have the vertical, we control very much the, the vertical supply chain. Uh, so if you look at the middle from, from here, it's, um, we go from agriculture, so we, we're growing oranges, we're growing grapes, we're growing different fruits. It's a business in itself. We're supplying here people like Walmart, for example, with fruit. Now, we, if you go down, we, we even develop new varieties. Then we develop the activity that we squeeze fruit. So we, we, the next step is we take the fruit and we squeeze it. When we try to squeeze it with Differential. How do we do it different? I'll mention it a little bit uh, different than the industry. Then we also do the bottling, which has to be lean and safe, etc. And then we do the most important thing, which is understanding the consumer. What, what is it that he wants? And that, link, that helps me link with uh, what kind of, of market are we approaching? Well, you've heard about private label. Uh, I heard, I think it's different than in the US. Private label has become for the retailers in Europe um, the way of telling the consumer, come to the shop, we have something the others don't have. So it's, it's everybody has Coca-Cola, everybody has Nescafe, uh, but um, this, the products that we work at are to make a difference. If you look at the slogan, somebody like Morrison says, products which are worth crossing the street for. Or if you look at Max Spencer, what they say is, uh, only at your Max Spencer, or um, waitress, famous for juices. So we, we have, with the clientele that wants to have special, unique selling points, especially in the, in the country. So we have to build the best French, build the best uh, uh, German, build the best Dutch, and work with the uh, different retailers. So we work with 70 retailers in, in Europe, with the most important ones. And um, um, so that is, um, and sustainability, you would see, is something we, we once we are working with uh, all, all our people in, in um, in, you know, with the retailers on their needs and, and what they want. We come back and go through the chain looking at opportunities to differentiate, to build a competitive advantage, and to be sustainable. Because actually, be, being very honest, we are very much involved in sustainability now because the retailers are, and the retailers are because the consumer is. So something I like about this mo movement is it comes from the, mm, from, from the housewife, from the buyer, from from normal people, they are the ones that we want us asking us to do the, the right thing, which is what we're trying to do. The other way here, no? Is it, is it too far. Yeah. <laughs> well, because we have to innovate a lot. We have a pleasure of saying that we got the we got the award for the most innovative the company in Spain from the King of Spain uh, four, five years ago. <laughs> okay. Here. So let's go to the interesting ideas. Um, so, very practical, very down to earth. Um, we squeeze some, today, some 300 million kilos. That would be, so you visualize it, like 15,000 lorries, the ones you find in the, in the, in the road. Missing them, that's this volume, it's 15,000. Now, 50% of it, 40, 50% is waste, is, uh, is peel. It's something, companies, when we started in 2001, I remember before 2000, 
uh, in the decade of 2000, we had a problem of where do we throw that away? Because actually, even if it is, it, it, it is a very, if it becomes um, a decay, it becomes a very big emitter from um, um, oh, methane, 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 or, uh, methane. Yes. Um, so we have this problem. Now, very often something we find in, in sustainability is that you start with the problem of sustainability and you end up with the economic advantage. You end up having a competitive advantage or you end up having... So why this happens, I don't know. We were working, we put our R&D people to work at what do we do with this flow of waste which we need to dispose of and which is not allowed to dispose of any waste. So giving you some examples, we work at the fiber uh, of, um, of the fiber of uh, fruit and it's being used to a product, to many products. One of them earned, uh, won this year the most healthy product in gut, gut health, uh, healthy pro uh, product in the PLMA. Um, so it, it, this is a product done with fiber. We work at the pomegranate and found out that in the, the research that at the peel of the pomegranate, uh, you can have, you have antioxidants in the juice, you have antioxidants in the peel. And that's where fiber goes together and can kind of break away from from both components. Now this becomes um, a very valuable ingredient for beauty drinks and for beauty creams. And we're working with a big company supplying them with this unique product which was developed. So something which was a waste stream, if you work at it and what can we do with it, you end up having very profitable, very interesting uh, uses of this. At the same time, we're not contaminating the environment. <laughs> Finally, the last one is the most interesting on, on this, uh, you know, the flow of squeezing is um, we, there's a big movement, uh, at least in Europe, to find the perfect vegetable protein. Um, so um, there are proteins, vegetable protein coming from peas, but they taste very bad. So we say, why don't we work at our stream again with this, uh, and find, trying to find it. Now, we then have gone into the um, biofermentation. Yes, it's gone. Um, <coughs> in English, that's... Bio, bio fermentation, which is we use <clears throat> um, stra strains of microbia, which are very determinant, and we, we make experiments to see how they transform the waste stream into, um, into protein. And after two, three years of research, we found the strain, the, the stra strain I believe, that uh, actually combined with uh, producers. Um, it produces the pro vegetable protein, which can go into veg burgers, can go into, into vegetable options uh, to meat. Um, so that is one of the ideas we've been working at. Um, second one, second one, package. Package, we are in the, the most beautiful package and the most attractive package for clients is PET. Now, uh, unfortunately, that is highly, it uh, has a lot of environmental problems. So what have we done? We are the first company in Europe that moved to 100% um, uh, recyclable um, um, plastic. We, we've um, eliminated, we've reduced the weight, we eliminated black uh, screws, which can, do not recyclate. And we've, with IKEA, which we are supplying all the, all the juices or drinks that IKEA sells, in the world, we move to, um, to uh, paper, what do you call that? Um, yes, yes uh, straws. Now, the, the interesting one I wanted to bring here to bring something a little bit more exotic is we are working at, again, from our waste stream, doing a, a bottle which is biodegradable, uh, biocompostable. So, thank you. So, basically, it's, if you throw a bottle of a PET bottle to the sea, I've heard it takes over a thousand years. In the presentation, it's only 100, but it's enough. It's, 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 it takes until it decomposes. It stays forever. So it's something that, that doesn't go back to nature. Now, when we're doing it with peel orange and some potato starch to, to blend it and com com compostable, we have a bottle that works. Unfortunately, it's a little bit too expensive now. We're working on reducing cost, but we, we, it, we're going to start using it for uh, bicycle drivers that want to have the glass, which is a little bit more expensive, but we were working at it. But we believe there will be a substitution of plastic by alternatives, which can come from, from the circular economy too. And the third idea, the uh, last idea, is on the sites. Now we have um, four sites in Spain, we have in Portugal, and we are in Holland. I mean, uh, oh, sorry. 
So let's see, we work in each of the sites to make it more sustainable. Uh, so the first one on the left, it's in, in Spain. That's the original factory. That, uh, that's the one started in 2001. Um, uh, so we have, not that it's too, very much, uh, but we, we have everything covered with um, solar energy. Now in Spain, you have th three, like the advertisement for the British, it says 300, from 365 days, you get 360 uh, with, uh, without rain, and the other five you were drunk. So uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't rain, it's like California. Um, so it's, um, we cover all, we, we get a modest uh, contribution to reduce um, uh, uh, carbon, but every bit helps. I mean, we keep on adding, every bit helps. We work um, to reduce energy use with biogas because we have to, we have to treat with um, anaerobic, with microbia, the flow of, of water that's in the process. In, and that's in Spain. Now, in, in Holland, which is where we moved to Holland for one thing. Uh, so we actually reduce carbon by economics and, um, and, um, and um, um, carbon reduction or decarbonizing. I think come, come often together. We, were, we started the business from Spain, but then we had a lot of clients in Scandinavia, Germany, France, and we were not competitive having to bring Jews from Costa Rica to Rotterdam, down to Spain, up to... So we decided the only thing we could do is build the factory in the strategic place, which is in the port of, in the port of Rotterdam, in deep waters. So we receive the boats from all around the world, together with the Spanish, which go from, from Spain, and um, unload them in, in the factory and can supply all Central Europe. Now, that helped reduce the carbon footprint. Um, but in, 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 we went to a place which is amazing. We are, at very, we are neighbors of, um, um, how do you call it? Uh, the offshore wind. wind. So we, we, we are actually in an area, <laughs> all the energy we get is green. We have to pay to help them, to help uh, in, to certify it. So it works. We get all the green energy we want. Everything is from renewable. We then um, use it, pay a premium, which actually needs the, the... And retailers are very happy to say, okay, so this bottle of juice was uh, $2.15. It's going to be $2.30, but it is green, and they buy it, and the consumer buys it. So that's where I think the strength of all this is. Um, we do take, um, because we're in Holland and the water is very cold, it's, uh, so we took, take water from the deep, deep, deepest, uh, uh, deep ocean, bring it up to cool all the systems. So there's savings in both water and energy. Um, we've invested in tank farms, which is a very Expensive but very useful way of having the boats from Brazil, let's say, that connected them to the tank farm. It, it goes without any heating, without any process, and without any transformation directly into the, 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 the bottle. And we are neighbors of this, of this uh, hub, of the greenhouse um, um, power bag, and we, we are talking with them because we want to connect in the future. We, we are looking at the possibility. It's not ready now. It's too expensive for our, it's used for another uses but it's also produ production of green um, uh, hydrogen. Nice. Um, what else here? So, now, if you look at the, up, up there, we, we have in the three scopes, our carbon print calculation in 2019, according to our department of um, 50,000 metric tons. Now, because of the, being in Holland, close to all this um, wind energy, we could move strongly in 2022. We hope in 2030, um, we're going to move to 50% and in scope one and two. And in scope three, uh, sorry, in and two, 2050 in scope one and two. In scope three, um, it's a lot of work outside, but because everybody is motivated. I mean, what we find is it's not us. We are not the sustainable company. We are a company supplying juice. Like everybody else, we're working on sustainability. That's the way it is in Europe now. So, like, it is for if you want to work with serious retailers, you have to be like, if you have. Um, control of quality, you have control of uh, ethics, you have control of every, you have sustainability controls, you, you have to do it, which is a very good movement. And a competition does it better or worse. It's another angle of competition, doing be good, well the, 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 the sustainability um, area, the ECG, and the, this is something that's measured, like the fi financial, uh, I understand the, the big funds are uh, measuring it too. In our case, retailers are measuring it and uh, communicating it. So that's a little, a little bit what I wanted to say. Hopefully these examples are interesting. Woo!
I want to thank everybody for your patience. This is a slide that I stole from an investment firm that I admire. And I think part of what you've been hearing across the panel is the idea that there are enormous business opportunities, there are enormous policy opportunities. They have to be hand in hand. We have to be looking at equity as we manage all of this. But it is not a time to stick our heads in the sand and be, oh my God, you know, what have we done? It is a time to stand up and say, what can we do? And there are remarkable, stimulating, mind candy opportunities to really address this epic challenge that we have. And uh, this is one of my favorite images, is uh, we really, the, the importance to us of sharing these stories, which I'm sorry we did not end up with an opportunity for public Q&A, but we are all gonna be here or be outside by the table where there are free copies of Speed and Scale, is we really wanted to take those of you that are already addressing climate risk leadership in some way to salute you and thank you for what you're doing. And for those of you that want to get more engaged, we're hoping that the conversation for this last hour and a half has helped inspire you. And questions we will take outside, and I think like it's lunchtime. We're standing between all of you. <laughs>